Okay, guys. So that was Title IX. This will be part three. Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. Rachel Carson is called the, the mother of the environmentalist movement. You've probably heard of people who are really concerned about global warming or climate change, they say now. Thank you, Becca and Audrey, for reminding me that's called climate change, not global warming. Rachel Carson in 1963 wrote a book called Silent Spring about the dangers of pesticides and how if we keep it up, someday we won't have the birds chirping and the crickets, cricketing, whatever you want to call it. So, huge book, huge uh, beginning with, because obviously the Dow Chemicals and the corporations making these pesticides want people to think they're safe, everything will be fine, the birds are dying left and right, fish are dying in the water. Rachel Carson notices this and writes a book about it. So it's a very, very important step in history. Certainly the environmentalist movement. Here's a little video on it. Not that one. Pesticides had become a way of life in post-war America, and by 1955, the country was being treated with more than 600 million pounds a year. But in 1962, I grew up with pesticides being sprayed in neighborhoods. No problem. You don't want mosquitoes up in Minnesota. Written by Rachel Carson. Can anyone believe it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without making it unfit for all life? They should not be called insecticides, but biocides. Rachel Carson painted a nightmare vision of the future. Silent Spring polarized the nation, and the ensuing controversy changed the course of history. A great book has a flow to it, and it changes uh, people's minds, it changes their outlook, and it has a long reach. Uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring is still uh, affecting our thinking and our policy making today. The essence of Rachel's message was that we had to come to terms with nature and work with it and not against it. In a complex modern society, of course, that's, that was a very radical concept, but in the sense of a, a change in our thought, I think she was revolutionary. So you remember Upton Sinclair, you remember the muckrakers, we talked about Ida Tarbell, Standard Oil. Rachel Carson and Ralph Nader, both of them could be considered muckrakers. Rachel Carson writing about the dangers of pesticides. What did you say, Ori? You want to say hi to my students? What's up, guys? Check out my YouTube channel. <laughs> What's the name of it? Look up Ori Grady on YouTube. Ori Grady, guys, look it up every day. He puts out a really great show. It'll be fun for you to watch. O R I Grady. You're not a spell Grady, I hope. So here's Ralph Nader. His parents were actually from Lebanon, just above Israel. He moves to America. He goes to Harvard. He starts doing research on General Motors and writes a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, meaning 
I don't care if you're going 50 miles an hour. This Chevy Corvair, if you turn quickly, you're going to flip. And it was not just about the Corvair, but the entire industry in Detroit. The big three, Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, they were putting profits before safety. The whole That's what the whole book was about. So because of him, we have seat belts now, and from the seat belts, we have airbags. We don't have big steel bumpers. I kind of used to like that, you know, because you could hit something a little bit, and a big steel bumper... Not even a scratch, practically, when I was growing up. But we realized these big steel bumpers are actually unsafe because they, you hit, they're going to go forward. Now we have cars where they're actually supposed to contract, make it where there's not as much force for the passengers. So you might end up having to get a new bumper or whatever made out of styrofoam inside, but it's safer. Okay, so that's Ralph Nader. Now let's go to the presidents. That's the rest of the lesson. We're going to do each president a little bit at a time, going all the way to President Trump. President Nixon, he was a Republican, 1969 to 1974. Now Nixon probably would not have become president if JFK, John F. Kennedy's brother, had not been assassinated a little bit before the election in 1968. He was giving a speech in California. After the speech, somebody came with a gun. Some guy that, uh, like a busboy there, and shot him in the back of the head and killed him. Most people think Bobby Kennedy would have won the election, but because he was killed, and remember we mentioned before with the Vietnam War, you should have learned, LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was the president after JFK was assassinated in 1963, did not seek re-election in 1968. He said, America, I will not seek re-election in 1968 because of the Vietnam War. He was just tired of it, tired of the hassle, tired of people saying, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Imagine having to go to sleep at that, hearing that as you lie in bed. So he had enough of it. He said, I'm not running. So Bobby Kennedy was going to take his place for the Democrats, but then he was killed. That's basically why Nixon was able to become president. And Nixon, vote for me, I'll get your boys out of the war, just like Woodrow Wilson. Vote for me, I'll keep your boys out of the war, World War I. Nixon had people thinking that he would uh, pull back from Vietnam, and then he became president, and he actually secretly started bombing even more, telling Americans, it's going great, we're winning, we're winning even though he knew that we were losing, we were losing. And he was bombing Cambodia and other countries without permission. So Nixon's also famous for signing the SALT Treaty and visiting China. We talked about that before in the Cold War. What mostly he's known for is Watergate. You see here, 1969 to 1974, he was reelected in 1972, but he did not last all the way to 1972. Uh, he did not last until the end of his term because of something called Watergate. Now, anytime there's a scandal, people say, blank gate, blank gate, this gate. That all started because of the Watergate Hotel uh, office complex. When Miss Madison's group and you all went to seventh grade Washington, D.C., you probably remember the bus driver saying, and on your right is the Watergate Hotel, the famous Watergate Hotel. Well, what it was, that was the national headquarters for the Democratic Party before the 1972 election. Number one, Nixon would have won the election anyway. He didn't need to do this, so that was stupid to begin with. He was way ahead in the polls. But some uh, people that worked for the Republicans broke into the Watergate office complex where the Democratic National Headquarters were, and they put little bugs around so they could hear whatever the Democrat at the time, uh, who McGovern, his name was George McGovern, who I believe was governor of Minnesota at the time. I know that because I used to live in Minnesota when this was going on. So they wanted to know what McGovern's strategy was so they could be one step ahead of it during debates or whatever, which was stupid. He would have won anyway. He didn't need to do this. So they caught the guys. They caught the plumbers who were going to put these bugs in. 
And the whole time, Nick said, I knew nothing about this. I know nothing about Watergate. I am not a crook. You can trust me, America. And your parents have probably told you, most of you have probably learned, it's okay to mess up. Just don't lie about it. How many of you, raise your hand if you've ever been told that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Good. Yeah, me too. I don't care if you lie, Jimmy. Wait. <laughs> I don't care if you do something wrong, Jimmy. Just don't lie about it. I go by Chris now, but I went by Jimmy. My name is James Christopher. I go by Chris now, but I was Jimmy as a little kid. So that was always the thing. Just don't lie about it. Well, Nixon lied about it. I knew nothing about Watergate. I had nothing to do with this. But for him, he was unlucky because he was paranoid. He was taking prescription drugs and drinking. You become paranoid. Let's face it. Drugs and drinking make you paranoid. So Nixon got paranoid. Anybody who would come into his White House office, he would push a little button and have these tapes, not fancy digital tapes. They didn't have digital back then. But these tapes that you have to take out goes round and round and round. These are called the Nixon tapes. And when it came out that he was recording everything on the White House, the Supreme Court said, you know, we want to see these. It'll help us. You got The Supreme Court said, um, you got to show these. People want to see these. This is my private property. These tapes are my private property. Well, White House is not private. White House is a public building. He's just borrowing. He's just leasing it. He's not leasing it because he's not paying any money to live there. But he's just staying there temporarily. So the White House said, no, you have to give up the tapes. And when that happened, forget about it. The whole time he was talking about, what are we going to do? Can we pay off these guys? Oh, I can't believe I did this all. Oh. Unfortunately, he made him look really bad. Very anti-Semitic things he was saying against Jewish people. Racist comments, profanity left and right. These were, 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 were. And now it was obvious he was lying under oath about this stuff. So he made some phone calls. Well, how's the senators? Are the Republican senators going to back me up? Uh, no, Mr. President, even the Republicans are going to go against you. So he resigned. He was never impeached. He knew if he had been impeached, the senators would have found him guilty. So he just resigned before he could even be impeached. Got that? Very important. Put that down for the time six also. He resigned before he could be impeached and then found guilty for the Senate. That's Nixon. I see a little video about Tricky Dicky, they used to call him. Tricky Dick. Because he lied. Somebody got in trouble for calling him Tricky Dicky. He was a sportscaster for Monday Night Football, and he mentioned Don Meredith was his name. He said, Tricky Dicky, he had to apologize. The only American president ever to have to resign his office in disgrace. Richard Milhouse Nixon, the 37th president of the United States, was born on January 9th, 1913. His parents owned a small grocery store in Whittier, California. The only reason we were able to make it go was because my mother and dad had five boys. And we all worked in the store. He excelled academically and graduated from Duke Law School, then returned to Whittier, California to practice law. He also joined a local drama club. Huh. And there he met another aspiring actor or actress. Oh Emma my god, I never knew that. They married, and in 1942, Nixon joined the U.S. Navy. Well, if you're going to get into politics, it helps to be uh, After the war, Nixon comfortable in front of people. He ran against a Democratic congressman named Jerry Voorhees, and he said that Voorhees was a communist sympathizer. He worked, and Nixon was elected. Nixon was on the House Un-American Activities Committee, which looked into State Department officer Alger Hiss's alleged ties to communism. Nixon shepherded an investigation that led to Hiss's conviction on perjury charges, and he became a household name almost overnight. In 1950, Nixon ran for the U.S. Senate and won. Two years later, General Dwight Eisenhower picked Nixon as his vice presidential running mate. Yep, yep. We discovered that Nixon he was vice president for Eisenhower. Eisenhower was prepared to dump him. We go ahead. 
This is when he loses to JFK. There's JFK. He beat Nixon in the 1960 election. Should know that. Here's the Watergate Hotel. There was a break-in at the Watergate offices of the Democratic National Committee. Watergate, guys. Investigators quickly learned that the burglars had ties to the White House. I knew all the Watergate burglars. Frank Sturgis would relate to me that E. Howard Hunt, G. Gordon Liddy would tell them, Richard Nixon wants you to do this, and Richard Nixon wants you to do that. But I just thought it was preposterous until Woodward and Bernstein brought it all out. The Washington Post reporters learned that the burglars had bugged the Democratic headquarters on orders of Nixon staffers. I, Richard Bill House Nixon, do solemnly swear. Nixon won re-election in 1972, but the Watergate investigation continued. In recent months, members of my administration and officials of the Committee for the Re-election of the President, including some of my closest friends and most trusted aides, have been charged with involvement in what has come to be known as the Watergate Affair. In February 1974, impeachment hearings began on Capitol Hill. Nixon denied knowing about the break-in. Congress learned the president had recorded his Oval Office conversations. That really did him in, because all of the suspicions that people had about his involvement in in the cover-up of Watergate came to light in these tapes. The leaders of the Republican Party on Capitol Hill went down to the White House to tell the President of the United States that he was sure to be impeached in the House. On August 8, 1974, Richard Nixon gave one final speech from the Oval Office. Hurry. I shall resign. The Jess, can you turn off that fan there, the please? He walks out. To it's a little loud, to yeah. To can you turn off the dehumidifier downstairs? It's a little loud here, I think. A tragic figure. At Thanks. At a tragic time in American politics. Gerald Ford was sworn in as the 38th president on August 9, 1974. One of his first acts was to pardon Richard Nixon. On April 22, 1994, Richard Nixon died. His public funeral followed five days later in his hometown of Yorba Linda, California. Okay. So that brings us to Gerald Ford also. Gerald Ford was a Republican. Let's see what we got here. There we go. Gerald Ford was a Republican. And really all you have to know about him is that he pardoned Nixon. The President of the United States has pardon power. Presidential pardon, it's called. If you're the president, you can go, you can pardon anybody, even if they're a murderer. It's in the Constitution. I mean, it's not going to be good for publicity and everything, but you you have that ability to. And that's what Ford is most known for, really. It didn't do a heck of a lot. The economy was going down 1970s with inflation. He didn't get reelected uh, in 1976. Jimmy Carter beat him. So the big thing... I want you to put down for President Ford is he pardoned Nixon. Nixon did not have to go to jail. Okay? So know that. Next is President Carter, who's a Democrat. So much in history you have swinging back and forth. Republicans in charge. Oh, Nixon is is a liar. Oh, let's go with Democrats. Democrats have it for 8 or 12 years. Oh, let's get a change. Let's go Republican. So if you look at history, it's usually back and forth, back and forth. President Carter, the Democrat, 1977 to 1981, how many years is that? Four, he did not get reelected. So keep that in mind. That's really important. He was considered an outsider. Nixon was a senator. He worked with Joseph McCarthy in the 50s. He was Dwight D. Eisenhower's vice president. He was somebody that was in Washington, D.C. in politics for decades and decades So after the lying in Watergate, America just said, you know what, let's go with this guy from Georgia. What does he do? Oh, I think he's a peanut farmer. What? Yeah, he's a peanut farmer, but also he was a governor of Georgia at one time, and he was a nuclear physicist. He's considered one of the most intelligent presidents we've ever had. He likes to kind of come off as like a good old boy, down-home country guy. He's also, uh, like I said, he was in the Navy as a nuclear physicist working on nuclear submarines. So put that, he's an outsider. Uh, One time they said, uh, so 
you say you're honest, right? Because another thing he was very, uh, he taught Sunday Bible school. And people like that about him too, the idea that here's a Christian man who's going to be honest. I think that helps him as far as the honesty thing, because, you know, the second, whatever amendment that is, first or second amendment, thou shalt not lie. So somebody said, okay, so you don't lie, Mr. Mr. Carter. No, I try to tell the truth. Remember, he's from Georgia. So let me ask you a question, Mr. Carter. Jimmy, just call me Jimmy. So which president, no, no president goes by Jimmy. It's always James, right? James Monroe, James Madison. But that was also part of his selling himself. I'm Jimmy. I'm an outsider. I don't go by a formal name like James. I go by Jimmy. So, Mr. Jimmy, yes, sir. You say you're honest, correct? I try to be as best I can. So answer me this question. Whatever you'd like to ask, sir. Have you ever cheated on your wife? Excuse me. Simple question, sure, sir. Have you ever cheated on your wife? Well, uh, yes, I have. So you've cheated on your wife? I have cheated on Rosalind, the love of my life. I've cheated her in my mind. What? I have had thoughts about other women from time to time. So wait, you haven't physically cheated on your wife? No, but I'm sad to say it. It says in the Bible, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. I have thought about my neighbor's wife. So class, Jimmy Carter says he's fantasized about other women from time to time after being married for 30 years. You think that's going to make it where people hate him, hate him, or maybe even like him even more because he's being honest. Correct. They said, Hey, the guy's being honest. I don't know. He said, look, honey, come on. So that actually maybe helped him a little bit. The famous interview where he admitted that he had thought about other women, but he had not done anything. So put that down for, Times four here, admitted he cheated on his wife in his mind, but also that he has one of the highest IQs as president, nuclear physicist, right here for the Times four. And another thing, after he swore in as president in 1977, I lived in Georgia at the time, so I was living down there. It was bicentennial, 200 years since the since the Declaration of Independence was signed, 1776 plus 200 is 1976. Jimmy Carter was elected president. I lived down there. It was such a special time being in, in, living in Georgia. Everyone was so proud of him. He didn't get in the limousine after swearing in as president. To go to the White House, he and his daughter and his wife walked the whole way. And the whole time I'm like, oh, please, somebody don't kill him. Somebody don't shoot him. No, no, no. After JFK, I'm, I'm still paranoid about presidents getting shot, getting assassinated. Unfortunately, America is kind of known for that, uh, killing their presidents. So he made it, thank goodness, to the White House. And he's still living. I think he's still alive. Uh, a long life, doing a lot to help uh, bring peace to the world. Uh, you know the Restore Building on 28th, Habitat for the Humanity? Jimmy Carter has made houses for them. He's gone to the Bronx in New York City in some tough neighborhoods with a hammer. He's also a carpenter and has built houses. He's a great example of how to act as president after you stop, become, after you stop being the president. Uh, Camp David Accord for this, the time six. Jimmy Carter wanted to bring peace to the Middle East. Every president does. Let's face it, it's not been easy for Israel over there. Jimmy Carter somehow was able to get the leader of Egypt, Muslim country, Sadat, to come to Camp, to Camp David, which is the weekend house for the president just outside Washington, D.C. in Virginia. Dwight D. Eisenhower called it Camp David after his, I think, his grandson, David. It used to be called Shangri-La. Uh, FDR came up with that term. But it's just a weekend house, 45 minutes away, an hour away for the president to get it get out of here, just like a lot of people from New York City come up to the Catskills. 
So he got Sadat from Egypt and Bagan from Israel to come to Camp David, and he would not let them leave until they signed a peace treaty. There were times he actually said, you are not leaving. I cannot let you go. We've got to sit down. We've got to have a peace treaty. So that was huge. But think about it. Pretend you're a fanatical Muslim in Egypt. And you just heard that Sadat, your leader, signed a peace treaty with the Jewish Israelis. Correct. Sadat went home. He was giving a speech. You go on YouTube and see it. I'm not going to show it. Sadat was giving a speech. All of a sudden, military trucks come into where he was giving a speech. And people are like, oh, they're going to make sure Sadat's fine. They're going to make sure security is good. No. These Egyptian soldiers jumped out of the trucks, pointed their rifles at Amor Sadat, and shot him dead. You don't make peace with the Jews of Israel. No leader of Egypt can make peace with Israel. That's bad. That's terrible. Guess what? Begin, the leader of Israel. Jasmine grew up in Israel, grew up in Jerusalem. We've gone there two or three times, I think four times now. I think the second time we went, we were going down the road, not too far from where she grew up, an apartment building. She said, see this spot right here? Yeah. That's where Begin was killed. A fanatical Jewish person, a fanatical Israeli, killed Begin, excuse me, yeah, killed Begin. Who was trying to make peace. Fanatics. So both of them killed by their own people for having the Camp David Accord signed. So for the time six, make sure you put peace treaty between Muslim Egypt and Jewish Israel. Both leaders killed by their own fanatical people. Iranian hostage crisis. Okay. I'll try to be quick with it because it's going to be on a video too, but here's what happened. We had overthrown the leader. We in England and the CIA had overthrown the leader of England in the 1950s because he wanted to socialize oil in Iran. Did I say England? I hope I said Iran. Leader of Iran, okay? So we put up like a puppet government, the Shah of Iran, military, uniform, no democracy, no voting. We want you in charge because you're going to give us good prices with the oil and you're going to let us keep on taking oil out of your country, correct? Yes. The Shah of Iran gets cancer. Where are you going to go for cancer treatment? You're going to come to America, the Mayo Clinic. While he's there, out of the country, fanatical Iranian Iranians storm the United States Embassy. Remember, we have U.S. embassies all around the world. They're supposed to be places of safety where you're not supposed to, you know, if you live and work in the embassy, you're supposed to feel like you're safe. you got a safe job. you got walls all around it. They break down the walls. They take the, the the American embassy workers as hostage, 70 of them. Hey, bring the Shaw back from his, his cancer treatment. We're going to put him on trial. He's killed lots of Iranians. We don't negotiate with terrorists. So those hostages were there. And we couldn't get him out. Every night, I swear, every single night when I was in college, the news would be Iranians burning the American flag, Jimmy Carter dummies burning the Jimmy Carter dummies, and it made Carter look weak. We tried one time to get him out, but the helicopter it was kind of like the Bay of Pigs invasion. It was a disaster. It didn't work out. We didn't get them out. Finally, they come out. Guess when they come out? About an hour after Ronald Reagan, the next president, becomes president, 
Jimmy Carter did not get reelected. Also because the economy was bad. Put that down too for the times eight. The economy was also bad. So he was not reelected. But the day Ronald Reagan became president, the news came out. Iran is releasing the hostages. That's like a, to Carter. We'll release them. When? A few minutes after Reagan becomes president. And here's what I love about Carter. I really respect him. Mr. Carter. President Carter, excuse me, sir. Jimmy. President. That must have made you so angry that those Iranian, that those American hostages in Iran were finally, they were finally released an hour after you stopped being president. Boy, that must have made you angry that they stuck it to you like that. No, that was the happiest day of my life. What? That's the ultimate insult. They let him go when Reagan was president, the Republican, but not you, the Democrat. No, all along I said, all I care about is getting them home free to their families with all of them alive. But that cost you the election probably. Yeah, the economy was bad, but the Iranian hostages made you look weak and it cost you the election. Them men and women coming home to their families alive is more important than some election. I tell you, and I'm honest, that was the happiest day of my life. That's pretty deep. That's, I, I love that about Carter saying that. And I believe him. I believe him. They were blindfolded. They, got, they were not 